Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, work on other logging applications and uh, we already have a schedule, even though we have not time. So uh, uh, I think it's like a project very brief uh, and uh, we only have a very short schedule. But when it comes to the workshop, uh, my name is Paul Brown and uh, my colleague has been back then from So, but here's the program for today, and as I said, the event will not start yet, and we know it's a hard schedule, so, so uh, the first thing we will be talking will be very short, and the highest note in the array of the So, can, can you hear me? I think it's uh, on the, in the right corner. So yeah, the that's the right corner. Ah. Okay, so, uh, uh, so uh, what I'll do is I'll give a brief introduction to the project and the history of the project. Thank you. 
Norden kan vi se, at vi har kommet nok ikke til TV fra Danmark. Vi kan se, at vi har til andre sikkert her, og den her transfers in to here. And then, as I said before, there was a value of the money in 15 20, and this is presumably the value here, where the Danish can question the second hundred of the Swedish government. So, so this is a, a typical view uh, in this, uh, in this uh, um, The E language is different because the uh, have traditional symbols is basic building blocks. For example, the symbol B you might stand for the three parts. And then you can add partition matrix and tensor operators. And for example, you can say if you mean that you will be the laser training task, you might be the task tensor operator. Okay. So these are the, the basic green blocks uh, of the A language. And they, again it turns out that you can find them in many different places in every day. And I, for example, in this painting here from the Danish uh, painter, Gars Nielsen, and you can see that uh, there's a train, it's about to be slowly coming out of the chimneys, and then a, a man and a wife, a wife presumably, has to watch the train, and, and the, the man is probably saying that her up the train is even now. So, uh, and this is typically, you was there at later in time. They don't see time from the outside, they are here now and they want to take this to uh, pieces. Okay. So what I've done now is that I've presented two different languages for you, the A language and the B language. It turns out that the A language can be translated into the B language, that is any A form that can be translated into the B form, but uh, not all B formats. And uh, this leads me to talk about the origin of hyperlogic in, in Asagraya's work. So Asagraya uh, is considered the founding father of, of uh, tense logic and what is now called hyperlogic. And uh, for philosophical reasons, I am strongly in favor of the A uh, And uh, he wanted to, uh, the A logic to encompass the Although his problem was that the A logic is really weaker than the B logic. So, uh, so what I did then was to call out the expressive power of uh, the A logic such that we got B logic expressive power such that we got two thirds of the expressive power. And the result was uh, the Capitan's logic. So uh, I'll now give you a brief, brief uh, overview of uh, the three different extensions that I used to conduct the present power of this document. The first the, the extension is constituted by so-called nominals. It turns out that all the extension document cannot express certain uh, statements that refer to a particular time. For example, this statement here is very certain to the second 1963. This is about a particular time where this flow and this flows and not at all. This cannot be expressed in ordinary, in ordinary uh, <coughs> things. So I can remedy this by, by adding new processional symbols, A, B, and C, or nominals. And uh, a nominal A is to a detail one time, so it is to the first word. And we use a nominal here to, to reform that such a statement. OK, so that was the first, uh, the first extension of uh, The second extension is constituted by so called uh, centration operators, and using centration operators, we can formalize these statements that is true at a particular time, for example, at the time we talk about before, uh, during the end of the shot. So at 12 serving levels from the second 1963, end of the shot. So, uh, so this is another type of expression that can be not expressed in the ordinary intention. To remedy this, I have invented what is uh, now is called sensation operators. So sensation operators uh, announce to state that 
something is the case that I see very often. So by any moment, the data has an effect on the community gas So this is a classified information. And the add a file is true if only a file is true at the time it refers to. So in a sense, the, the add operator or the, the back operator comes to uh, move the time from uh, where you are to that particular time, maybe the one referred to by it's also called the jump over here, yeah, sometimes. So that's the same extension. The third extension I'll be very brief about that because it, it doesn't take a, it has bigger role as the other two extensions do. And this is uh, what's called a binder. This is something you can prefix in normal. First of all, right, as, as most of you already know. But, but the effect is, uh, is uh, similar. And uh, uh, it turns out that, uh, that uh, if you have the three different pieces of machinery that we talked about until now, you could look at the first of the power, of course, with a certain language. And from a single point of view, it does solve the price problem. There's a philosophical issue whether it, 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 you avoid an ontological import that why you didn't want a particular regarding uh, times. This is a, a, a long discussion and, and uh, uh, problem not unsettled, uh, problem not, not settled by now. But I'll like move on and, 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 and somehow uh, uh, leave this for another time because the transaction hybridization uh, remedies a number of, of diff deficiencies of ordinary tense and modal logic. So, so by giving the tense logic to solve a philosophical problem, it is debatable whether he actually managed to do this, but it turns out to be very useful for other purposes, uh, the machinery that he invented. Uh, and this is what I'll, I'll say a few words about now. Uh, so I'll say a few words about the proof theory of hybridity. And it turns out that, that you can give a range of different proof systems for hybridity in, in a very natural way. And, and the example here that I mentioned. National production system, but it could be Gensen style uh, sequence systems, or it could be the flow system, or perhaps uh, other system. So uh, you get a sound and complete uh, proof system for, uh, for hybrid work. And what's important is that certain standard post theoretical requirements are satisfied. Uh, so, uh, and in this case, it's this normalization of the soft form and property. I'm not going into detail with that. But I'm just trying to do so to, to, to uh, work the French consideration of the and not to not contemplate it like a car or an engine. So, uh, so when we postulate a system of antibiotics, we usually want to have it uh, that it satisfies certain natural mathematical properties, the contemplation or in this case, normalization and the soft form of And it turns out that it works, and more. Uh, if you have a proof system for hybrid logic, it turns out that you can in a very, in a very nice way extend it with, uh, with uh, further rules capturing conditions of the accessibility relation. I'm not going to into details here, but this is uh, something called geometric series. Uh, but it turns out that, that uh, if you have a, almost whatever model of time, for example, you want to, to model, then you just uh, formulate it as for the proof rule, you plug them in, uh, into your system and you get all the desirable properties here uh, almost for free. So whatever real version of time you have, you can just go plug in actions from the proof rules and then you can turn on to work. So, uh, uh, and this is a new pattern that you don't find in ordinary mode of At least, uh, as long as you stick to, to proof systems that are close to business we can have the best because of the systems and, and, uh, uh, and similar systems. Okay, so the thing here is that in, in order to put in order to put in order, you only have very few well-behaved and really proof systems for uh, S5, S4, S4, or not even S5, 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 and the relation between the main systems is, is unclear, so we don't have a, a 
and you might make an analogy to uh, the direct system industry, you don't have that for all of them, but you do have a few of the aggressive boundary. So this is a technology message that, uh, that some of these deficiencies they can be repaired when you, when you, when you have a, a stronger uh, industry. I'm saying what I have a lot is there are many more issues um, I don't have time to review each and every one of them. I myself have used uh, hyperlogical to deal with issues in cognitive psychology. If you are interested in that, uh, feel free to talk to me later. And here are some other references. So I, I think that, that that's all. So. Double row of nominals is, is, is worth remembering that this 
on the one place there are syntactical sentences, yes, but on the other hand they behave like a kind of a names. And uh, so, uh, okay, let me skip this because it was already explained by Tobin. The motivation for such a move, uh, and the historical rules were also already presented, but was connected with uh, obtaining some more expressive languages, uh, also better behavior and completeness theory, more natural and simple proof theory. This is the this is the point which will be of interest for us for 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 for, for me now. Yes, and also byproduct of this that we obtain systems which represent a very good, very very good behavior in uh, many many for many things like inside the the complexity of the procedures. Uh, interpolation results for the logics and so on and so on. So, and the nice thing about hybrid logic is that uh, the changes on the semantical side, the side are minimal. And we are operating with the same, same uh, notion of a model. In fact, uh, uh, in the case of this basic uh, language, you can just add the, the assignment function, which is operating on nominals, yes, in the sense that uh, each nominal base assign some uh, mm. uh, state or a world which is uh, its denotation, so the new satisfaction uh, clauses are like that, that. For instance, nominal are satisfied in the words W. Uh, even on if uh, W is the designation of this I under the, uh, the assignment A, and uh, for this satisfaction statement, it is something like that. that if it is evaluated in W, it means that uh, phi without this uh, uh, operator is satisfied simply in the word that we will rhyme, yes, which is a denotation of this nominal act, yes, under the assignment. Okay, so yes. semantically there is a really, really very, very, very modest changes needed, but the, the advantages are great, yes, because we obtain the platform where the, we have an internalization of local discourse. And in the sense that in standard language for modal logics, for temporal logics, we are rather have something like a global, yes? And, and here we can say something about the, what's going on in some special uh, places, yeah? And so, there is one advantage. The post, uh, post uh, explicit uh, expression of jumping from one state in a model to another and internalization of the satisfaction process from the semantics in the language set. Representation of something like an identity or a quality theory for states or words, yes? Because something like that, that F I J, yes? It means simply that I and J are different names for the same state. And also, that in, a post in a similar way, that are internalization of access relation between the words, yes, in by, by means of such, such formulas, yes, that at I, a diamond, a J, yes, it means that, uh, okay, uh, there is a, a possible, possible way through the uh, accessibility relation uh, from uh, the word denoted by I to the word denoted by J. And also, formalization of several frame conditions which we cannot express in standard model logic by means of standard model formulas like given flexibility and symmetry and so on. And so these are just that. This is not the full what we get. Yeah? That's, but there is this modest selection of, of, of many advantages we obtain uh, when we get to, uh, from the standard model language to, uh, to the language uh, to hybrid. Uh, language, even this basic one, yes, because we can it can be extended in many uh, many different things. For instance, by introducing several kinds of binding operators, like quantifiers, but also some specific ones that so called donor uh, have no time for presenting the details. But at least uh, if uh, will be primarily used by means of uh, uh, resolution. And then we mm, focus on proof systems for hybrid logic. And uh, my talk is uh, based on just on three uh, books which uh, are focused with this subject. Um, the book of Torque, Hybrid Logic and its Proof Theory, uh, the book of Mine, Natural Deduction, Hybrid System and Modal Logic. 
and also the book written by my previous PhD student, Michal Zawiski, the Dotex system and the Disagabi problem for hybrid logics. And uh, so basically all the material and, uh, here will be from, taken from these three books. But of course I was trying also to uh, make some uh, uh, make some notes concerning some later, yes, uh, the, the later words which were uh, done after the, because this is, you can notice all these books are rather old. Yeah? <laughs> so nothing nothing here was so far provided. Yeah? Okay, so proof systems for hybrid logics we, uh, we, mm, are we uh, logicians working with hybrid logics were very productive. In this area they provided systems of uh, several several well-known kinds uh, like key, uh, axiomatic systems, uh, sequence calculi, table systems, natural deduction systems, resolution systems, and also I will mention you if, if, uh, if I don't have time for it about something like a hybrid systems for hybrid logic which has, which means that uh, I mean that the, the mixing of this uh, abbreviation uh, HR and E means that hybrid resolutions uh, resolution based natural deduction, something like that. Yes, and so just to how to get the what is the best I mean these both kinds of, of approach. Uh, I'm not sure if I was really successful with that but then the way I was trying to do my best. So the uh, type of proof system for hybrid logic there is another division which we can uh, provide. For instance, we can roughly divide the proof system for hybrid logic into three classes. Standard calculi, yeah? It means that uh, the, we are, uh, the rules are defined for arbitrary formulas, yeah? And, but on the other hand, the very popular approach is to use the so-called sub Calculi. It means that uh, rules are defined for the formulas of this form, in this uh, short uh, sub formulas, formulas preceded by an operator. And, um, and also mixed calculi, which are uh, sometimes used some external resources like letters, for instance. And one, one can ask uh, reasonably, and in what sense sub calcula uh, can be complete? Yeah? If, if we, on, the, on the, the, the first step, we are making a restriction in uh, what uh, kind of formula are considered. <coughs> but, uh, not that uh, already in the basic system, yes, in the, for, in the basic language, we have something like that. that uh, if the thesis of the value formula is of such a form that at a is phi and i uh, is uh, not occurring in phi, yes? so, so it, it, it's, a, it's a fresh nominal, yes? If this is a thesis of the phi formula, then uh, simplify is a thesis. So we have yeah, no generality in this approach, yes? Simply, if we want to prove then the arbitrary phi, we simply start with uh, uh, at i phi providing that phi is not present in, in, in phi. That's all, yes? So, we, well, so this is, I must say that these are the, seems to be, I don't know if you agree, the most popular approaches are, although I must say that uh, we said that there is a, um, still growing interest in this first class. The witness is your paper, you let them know the section of logic, but yes, they were, they were, they were collecting information about several uh, approaches to this. And, 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 and so you are concerned with the normalization problem for, for that, yeah? So, but if, uh, so far, this approach was the most popular. Okay, uh, as for axiomatic system, I think there is not uh, make sense to, to dig into details, but just let me, uh, let me put some axioms. One of the, most, the, the, the earliest, is the, the most popular axiomatic approach to IP uh, logic is that we take uh, some uh, standard axiomatic system, let's say for the for the logic K, uh, you know, this uh, necessitation rule and all this stuff, yes, and then we add some special axioms and rules, yeah, for uh, these are uh, this set of axioms, the rules, not that the last two rules, N and BG, are uh, not really needed if we, for instance, think uh, only about the system for K, yeah? That they are required if we are interested in stronger logic, like S4, for instance. Yes, so in this uh, situation we need also these stronger rules. 
otherwise they are not necessary. And uh, <coughs> some more general information. So the, maybe the, the, such an explanation was provided uh, earlier. I don't remember exactly, but uh, I will, uh, certainly it is in the paper from IGPL journal in 1990 and uh, 99. And uh, but the most important article which provides a uh, lot of interesting results concerning axiomatic approach in uh, hybrid logic is the work of President uh, Barrett and Hatter published in Studio uh, in the, uh, uh, 2006. This is the one, one, one of the most uh, important things. Also, uh, this uh, axiomatic system was uh, such that, okay, we have already some system for uh, the logic K okay, and we add some special uh, axioms and rules. But of course, we can start from the scratch, from hybrid uh, language, yes, and, uh, and uh, provide uh, to the, a very nice axiomatic system uh, for hybrid logic, and it was done by, by, by Torben in, in your book earlier, yes, and in, in some of your papers we were earlier before the publication of the book. And so this is the uh, second possibility, yes, the, the, the second tradition of how we can provide axiomatic formalization for hybrid logic. And, uh, and also, uh, axiomatic systems are in a sense uh, um, uh, important because uh, quite recently there were uh, intense studies, research on the uh, hybrid logic of hi higher order hybrid logic, in particular on hybrid type system and equational type, propositional type theory, and uh, made by many people, including RSS Blackburn, Huertas Manzano, uh, and Martins. And uh, they provide a lot of interesting papers, but uh, in this case, uh, the only syntactic formalization was axiomatic one. Yeah? There, are, there were no other systems, so this is the uh, open area for further investigation. Yeah? So, 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 and and, and uh, for this uh, reason, uh, in particular, axiomatic systems are important uh, for hybrid logic. Uh, but let me focus on uh, sequence calcula, which in my opinion are the most the general, the most universal platform framework for, for dealing uh, with logics. And uh, we can, uh, historically, we can uh, say about some standard sequence calcula due to Jerry Zeligman. In fact, uh, there were earlier system of the, in the early 90s, uh, Jerry was working on uh, the sequence calculus for situation theory, yes, and it was syntactically it was almost the same, yes, but then uh, then he he was get, got involved in the uh, the work on hybrid systems and made some in uh, 1907 there was a very important work, um, so it is somehow with the break of, break of these two centuries. And uh, there were several uh, subcalcula, sequel calcula, due to Patrick Blaker, to Dorben Breuner, to Bolander Breuner, to Mimi and Zawicki, which was dealing with strong modalities of several times and terms. And also, uh, these two uh, papers of mine maybe are of interest because uh, there, uh, there are all these uh, sub uh, sequence calcula I can touch with, yes, but um, on the other hand, for instance, in the work of the there is no direct uh, constructive proof of, of this fact. It is rather obtained by the kind of transformation uh, from another uh, system for uh, first of the first of the, uh, the logic, which is cut free, and the transformation is uh, preserving uh, many properties, including uh, um, cut freeness. So, and uh, also there, were, there, there, there was another, mm, another uh, proof of, of, of Teresa Gitman, but kind of non constructive, I, I must say, in some respect. Yes? Not ordinary, yes, because there are some, some uh, changes on the, on the global parts of the proof and something like that. But, uh, so, uh, in these two papers, uh, in the first one, there is, for, uh, there is a constructive calculation proof for propositional hybrid logics and uh, in the second one for quite strong uh, first order uh, hybrid logic with uh, lambda operator and delta operator. So, okay. 
and uh, non-star. This is a quite interesting thing that uh, there was one one of the areas formalization of hybrid logic were uh, already non-standard ones. It was a very interesting sequence calculus uh, of Stephen Henry for an uh, even uh, weaker version of hybrid hybrid logic because it was only nominal but without sort of operator. Yeah? So even weaker one and there was a interesting trick with uh, using um, something like an implication uh, when uh, the word uh, nominals are antecedents. Yes, it, in a sense, uh, it, it was possible to simulate the behavior of, of such operator. And also a display that was due to memory and, and graphic work. And, uh, okay, there was a quite publishing that, um, that, that was submissions on the Dumbo conference and, and published in the proceedings. And, uh, <coughs> Let me uh, focus uh, on standard sequence calculus due to Jerry Zeldman. It consists of four kinds of rules. Standard Gensen rules, rules for nominals, for sub-operators and for modal uh, factors. Standard, uh, structural rule, let, let, let us take uh, something like uh, Gensen's original LK and a system with structural rules, but of course we can also use some other variant like G3 without uh, such a rule and so on. This is uh, not uh, very important, but okay, we have standard structural rules, structural in the sense that no uh, constant is uh, present in the schemata of the rules. And standard logical rules uh, for Boolean connectives and also, and now, now this is the in interesting part. The rules for nominals, yes, this one is global, it is a kind of substitution of, of um, uh, one nominal uh, in all formulas which are in uh, this uh, complex multiset gamma and delta uh, by some other on the condition that both are stated uh, in the other set. One of the informal way of uh, reading sequence is that something when we are going up from the conclusion to the to the um, premises is that we uh, uh, assume that, okay, uh, we are in the, uh, some, let's say, world, in a modern world, uh, all the formula in the antecedent are true, all in the succedent are false, yes, so it means that if they are both true in the same place, so they are, uh, they are naming the same word, yes, so this, this, is the, this is why we can make such a substitution, yes, through the whole sequence. And the, the rest of them are some manipulation with them uh, restricted, of course, because, okay, we, we can either get, get rid with a nominal uh, on introducing, like a form of, of, of chemical rule, yes, but, uh, but on the condition that all other formulas, uh, gamma and delta, are subformulas, so they are preceded by uh, operators. Or we can also get rid with I. Uh, provided that it is a fresh one, yes, it is not, uh, they, have, they, they have no other occurrences in, in the second. Yes? So the <coughs> and the system is, uh, as you can see, is not standard in the, in the sense that not all the rules are uh, introduct rules of introduction, yes, because there are rules of elimination, and also when we have rules for sub operators, uh, we see that this is the same, yeah? Here are introduction rules to the antecedent to the succeed that, yes, and here are elimination rules. So this is like in, rather like in natural deduction, yeah, the full symmetry is, <coughs> is here. And okay, very often such a full symmetry is, is probable, but we see yes, for many kind of constant and sequence calculus, but the, the, the uh, nice thing is that we do not need to take it as a primitive, yeah? but in this, uh, in this case, unfortunately, it is uh, necessary. Yeah? It, it, they are not the And also rules for models, which uh, in a syntactic form just uh, represent the ways of, of, of uh, skipping to other, uh, other words. For instance, this side condition, like in, 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 in this rule and in this, is clear that, okay, if in some state, this is true, and we know that from the state some uh, word i is accessible, then in this uh, uh, 
then this formula is two. It means that phi is satisfied with aliens. So it's a standard way of, of dealing with uh, modalities. Okay, and nice example of proof, of course, but we skip it. And advantage is a short comment. Advantages, no restriction on formulas. In sequence, yes, we are the rules are coming with arbitrary formulas. Uh, cut uh, is eliminated, but, but not in a very direct way, as I said. And it is advantages that we have, uh, except in production rules, we, are, we have also the, 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 the elimination rules for nominals and subordinates. And as a consequence, uh, uh, this sequence of rules is not fully analytic. And um, subcalculate, there were many of them. Uh, but of course, it's, uh, at, at first it is something like that. All uh, standard rules are uh, replaced by the rules where every member of the sequence is preceded by an uh, uh, operator, like, like here. Also, the same for the connective rules. We see that uh, all the time there is the, the, the same at aliens, everything is. Is, is the same in the conclusion and in the premises. Uh, in modal rules, uh, these are the interesting important pair of rules with, uh, which shows that uh, uh, putting uh, before, if we are putting some <coughs> sub operator uh, with arbitrary uh, nominal before sub formula, it is redundant. Yes, it, 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 we can always get rid of that. And also, the rules which have the same sense as in the third one, but, but they are <coughs> most uh, complex in the sense that the, these formulas all are preceded by the operators. And special rules for nominals. It is something like the, again, the, which uh, the equality theory for nominals. Yes, this, this just uh, express uh, the, the reflexivity. And, uh, doing with this rule uh, and this we, we can also provide uh, provide uh, proofs of uh, symmetry and transitivity for, for such kind of uh, formulas uh, and special rule for frame conditions. This is that when we make the, we are all, all the time focused on the system for K just to um, not, 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 not to get rid of too many details. But I think this is a good point when we can have made a short impression of how we can extend this to cover stronger logics. Yeah? So one of the possible ways is uh, to focus on this geometric formula. In, in particular, every geometric formula can be uh, replaced by so-called basic geometric formula, which is of this uh, schema. Yeah? Yes, uh, and for such. Uh, formulas, and this is a, a huge class of, uh, of formulas which can uh, express several, uh, several conditions on frames, yes, in semantics of modal logic, of temporal logic. And uh, if we use the standard e uh, HT translation, that's, so we start with the language with uh, equality uh, and with uh, one binary and one binary. Uh, predicate. Uh, naturally, this corresponds to the accessibility relation between the points, and this one to the fact that something is satisfied with the point. And so, and, and if we are, if we apply this translation, we can obtain on the basis of, of every formula, which is uh, basic geometric formula, corresponding formula in hybrid language. Yeah? So, and on this basis, we can, for instance, provide such kind of rules. And uh, these are, so here we, uh, we, we have the translations of this formula corresponding to, the, uh, uh, to this conjunction. Yeah? And here, a uh, set of formula, because here uh, can, be, uh, can be conjunctions of, of some formula. Then, then here you have an atoms obtained by the translation. Uh, one can say, okay, it, uh, this rule does not look very nice yet because it's something like a cut, multiplied cut. But we can make uh, sometimes like that. For instance, we can use some kind of translation 
for, for example, and put this formula here, and yes, so it, it has uh, quite a bit better look. In fact, uh, for many specific form formulas concerning the popular condition of frames, we can uh, make a much uh, more tune and obtain very, uh, very good rules which uh, still satisfy the formula for that. That's not that important. And uh, because double systems, at least in the, in the, in the standard sense, uh, are not uh, very far from sequence calcula, you can Say that okay, we just we can simplify things. Just uh, put the the things other ways around, yes. And and, and, and instead of uh, using sequence, just using uh, simple formula. So I will not get into this part. But the, the details of of, of uh, double calculus, which are very popular, but rather make a list of some important words. Yes, of course. Uh, forgive me if I uh, if I have avoided someone. And it, that, that, that this is, is certainly not uh, uh, not full. Uh, and but uh, for mixed tablet, one of the earliest approaches was due to Sakova. They were uh, essentially improved in, in the, the works of Bolan Broiner uh, and Blackburn. Uh, there were a lot of uh, versions of uh, sub tablet for satisfaction formula. Mm -hmm. Patrick Blackburn. Bolander, also uh, Kaminski and Smolka, and also Michał Zawiski provided something like that for uh, stronger logic with greater modalities with counting of the waiters. So, and uh, all this uh, in all all these papers you can find uh, several interesting results uh, concerning uh, such problems that this I can be the process procedure termination of this set procedure, several strategies for that, how to avoid includes and so on and so on. Yeah? So, and uh, <coughs> uh, for standard tableau, uh, it is quite surprising that only recently there were some uh, papers dealing with that. Can you agree with, with me or is, uh, the, the were some, do you know some earlier words which provide standard tableau except this? No, why did I, I, I also couldn't find anything? And one uh, nice uh, thing is that there was an automated prover Hydra and provided by Jacob Barker and Walter at the beginning of this century. And uh, I don't know, maybe there are some others, but I, I, I don't know. And uh, one of the most important results obtained by means of uh, uh, calcula is that interpolation was proved constructively by Blackburn and Marx using uh, sub tableau and uh, this is very, very interesting and important for instance if we take um, a standard a first order modal logic then it appears that all this uh, well known uh, modal cube logic between K and S5 you cannot provide the, uh, interpolation yes, for, uh, for them but when you are using hybrid logic with this so-called down arrow operator, which is uh, needed to to bind some uh, some nominals on the way down in the proof, uh, then we can obtain a uniform constructive proof of uh, interpolation for, for for this logic. This is very interesting result, very important one. Uh, this year, uh, Michał Zawicki and uh, the joint work of, uh, of Michał and, and, and me submitted two advances in modal logic. So I hope they accept it. Uh, well, this is an extension of these results to the much richer languages with lambda and yoga operators. Uh, but it is just on the top of, of, of the results of, of Patrick and Martin. And uh, natural deduction. Also, there, is, there was a lot of proposals, some of them standard natural deduction, one in the uh, to the Zarek man. There was also some uh, of uh, mine. The, the main difference is that the Zarek man system was uh, by ad the addition of special rules to some arbitrary natural deduction system for classical propositional logic. 
Uh, in my case, it is rather on the some natural disaster system for the K system, and of course, it can be extended to stronger logics. And the uh, 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 sub natural deduction due to Torpen, uh, where this is uh, also a constructive proof of normalization for, for this system. And some conventions uh, to just to simplify the presentation of rules is alpha and beta convention that. Uh, Alpha, let's say, are something like not branching formulas and beta branching formulas, but of course, in the natural deduction, we are not branching, but actually, rather are false. In this second part, we use some uh, simply uh, two premise rules, yeah? And, uh, and the convention that this minus pi means simply that either we add negation if the formula is unnegated or we cast it. And I, uh, I like to use uh, linear system of Kaiser Montague built on the some uh, earliest form of natural deduction due to uh, Stanislaw Jaszkowski. That is the, 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 the compact form of representation of the inference rules. Uh, in, in this practice, you have uh, proof construction rules, which means that if you provide some uh, sub proof on the basis of it, if you have, have an outer proof. Well, it's schematic, for instance, this one. This covers, for instance, standard rule of introducing uh, conditionals. For instance, if we want to, sh to prove, to show that some implication box, let's we simply start the subderivation for it, starting with the uh, antecedent of this conditional, and we are going down until we go uh, succeeded, then we use the box, then we cancel this show and this beta this conditional is um, for the remaining construction of the proof is formula which we can use yes for part of the derivation. And this is for the, this is model, this one. Uh, this is an uh, important difference, yes? Because here we can use any formula from gamma here, yes? And this is not the, the rule of so-called greater ratio is restricted. Only if we have uh, about some formulas, if we want to to prove that uh, box pi holds, yes, we can uh, we can uh, start a subproof for that. But it is a strict sub subproof uh, in a sense that we can use inside of that only some formulas which outside are preceded by boxes. Yes, and when we go to phi, we can close this uh, box, and of course. Necessarily, phi is um, admitted for further okay. So, and uh, we can, uh, in the variable of the lima, we are using just this part of this system, which is for classical propositional logic. And we add this set of rules. Moreover, the last one is not necessary if we think only about k, yes, if, if we don't need to stronger logics. And also we have add this uh, proof construction rules as well, schematically like that. In the first case, we simply, in order to show phi, we start um, assumption A, uh, but this calls on the, on, the, on the assumption that all the formulas in gamma which are used here are also sub-formulas. Yeah? If something is not a sub-formula, it cannot be used here. And in this case, there is no restriction. Everything which is outside is subproof, may be used here. And so this is just natural deduction representation of these rules which were used in simple calculus. And uh, here is a nice example of a common time. And the, the second one, oh, because just this is quite important example because. The uh, system is based, okay, is based on the uh, natural deduction system for classical logic. Yes? So, uh, in order to, uh, to prove uh, something like a uh, well-known axiom, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it appears that you must do a lot of things. Yeah? It is not so simple. That was my motivation in providing this variant of natural deduction, which is already based on the natural deduction for, uh, uh, let's say, system K. Yeah? We have already this one, and 
Also, the number of routes, and that this system is very redundant. Yes, we can uh, we can make a lot of uh, of eliminations of this route, but anyway, it is, it was just by convenience of proving, yes, in order to obtain shorter uh, is uh, 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 shorter routes which are which, which you can easily construct. Yes, so we. That's why it is redundant. It is based already on some apparatus for standard modern language. Uh, the proof construction rules are like that. And so simply, in addition to the standard uh, rule for proving necess necessity formulas, this uh, this this one is additional uh, and this one. Yeah. So. <coughs> And it works uh, quite nice. I think there are some uh, again there are some uh, example of proof. This one and this one. Okay. And the system of of top and Broiler, which is SAT system. So here, just from the square view, have our rules defined on formulas uh, uh, preceded by uh, operators. Yes, this is our. Uh, uh, language restricted to uh, Boolean languages restricted to conjunction, implication, and, and both. And uh, all this stuff connected with, uh, with uh, modals and with uh, hybrid uh, ingredients of the language. A very elegant uh, uh, formulation. Uh, these are three uh, rules for construct for, for, for proof construction. Uh, now that uh, the original presentation of uh, the system is uh, not in this Jaszkowski College Montegu style but in against an original style that uh, the proof are uh, tweets or formulas yeah labeled with, with, with formulas. Uh, of course it is uh, it seems to be necessary to provide a normalization proof yes okay mm, uh, there are uh, the, in, in fact, there is possible, at least for some restricted languages, to provide also something like normalization proof for a uh, system of natural detection which are, uh, of the, uh, where proofs are these uh, nested structures. Yes, but it's a bit complicated. Uh, already standard normalization proof in the tradition of that province are already quite complicated in, as in with all these details. So, so it is better if, if we are concerned with the uh, theoretical methods, it's much better to, to use uh, tree presentation. But of course it can be transformed also in the linear presentation in any part for, for instance, this is an example of two with the high interview style. And resolution. There, there were uh, some kind of, of uh, work on resolution connected with the automated problem high -less which was done by RSS, the new world, the right, heck we have the L, and the system of a reason generalized clause. What does it mean? Uh, clauses are just something like mm, this junction of uh, literals, yes, uh, atomic formulas or negation of atomic formulas. In the generalized clause we assume we admit that uh, there may be also some complex formulas as uh, uh, elements of this, this junction. But of course, it is also that uh, all formulas are assumed to be in uh, negative normal form by means of this uh, uh, preprocessing step. And uh, the rules are like that. For instance, we have a clause gamma and, uh, and this formula, and a second clause delta and this formula, and we make a resolution step. We cancel these two contradictory formulas, we got this. Clause, yes, gamma, which we, we is a con concatenation of, of gamma and data. These are uh, some uh, quite standard rules. Either, either all rules have uh, such a schema that either we start with um, uh, two clauses and obtain one, or we start with one clause and obtain two clause. In general, uh, in general, uh, these are uh, some special for extension which are regarded by, by the authors of this uh, Hylores and for, for T, for D, for 4. Of course, if you take these two rules, you obtain the system for S4. And, uh, <coughs> and also extension uh, for this, this down arrow binder of nominals, which I, 
I already mentioned, which is very strong uh, uh, addition. In particular, unfortunately, uh, the addition of, it, of, of this to, to, to some uh, language and logic which is decidable in the, in the language uh, makes the system uh, undecidable. So this is a something for something. On the other hand, we obtain interpolation theorems yes, for such an extension without any problems. And uh, so this is uh, increasing and, uh, and the construction of proof is something like that, that we are just going, uh, we are just uh, using sets of clauses, generalized clauses, clauses we are making, uh, we are uh, applying rules to them uh, until, we, until we got the empty clause, yes, which is uh, the same as, as uh, both. And, uh, in this case, we have a refutation of, of X. So, um, uh, this is uh, the system which is a, something which is, uh, has a spirit of resolution system, but of course, uh, many elements of tableau system, in fact, are uh, embedded in it. Uh, and uh, this is an example for in this table with L down arrow, yes, how, how it works. Yeah. And because we are running out of time, very, very briefly, this hybrid system for hybrid logic. So, how to get it, uh, uh, in general? Resolution are effective, but rather not user friendly. Yeah, it's, it's for machines, not for people. Uh, on the other hand, natural deduction systems are for, uh, for people. Yes, yeah, are for natural <coughs> construction of proof. How to get something which we have the advantages of both, and on the other hand, maybe uh, we will have not the disadvantages, the shortcomings. We, we, we can skip over the shortcomings of our approaches. Yeah. I was trying to provide something like that 10 years ago, and uh, it's something like a natural deduction system with only one very general proof construction rule. Yes, sub of from subsumption. That's, uh, the description is maybe quite complicated. Mm, uh, uh, schematically, schematically it looks like that. Oh. As, uh, here we have some set of clauses, generalized clauses, which can be used, and we want to make a proof of a clause gamma, generalized clause gamma. We uh, can use any, any file, uh, which is an element of this clause, and use its negation for example, or cancel negation if it is already negated. Yes, as a, we can use all of them instead, but an arbitrary uh, selection of them, it doesn't matter. And the <coughs> proof uh, finishes when we got a clause with this subsume under this one, yes? which is, which, uh, so in particular we make it empty. If we, uh, if we take uh, as this uh, minus phi all the elements phi of the gamma, and we obtain here empty which means both. Yeah? Uh, this is just a uh, uh, reduction proof, but we, we can make any mm -hmm. possible uh, versions of, of that. We are free with that. And this is the spirit of natural deduction uh, in contrast to resolution with, for, for which we are using only reduction uh, proof. And uh, inference rules. Uh, bit standard. Again, we are dealing with uh, the, the, the clauses are defined like in, in high or less on sub satisfiability sub formulas. Uh, so, um, this is quite standard set. These are more interesting because they are for models for, uh, and also for nominals and for sub operators. Again, in order to provide you all the necessary elements which were already uh, explained by me on the occasion of. Uh, this is uh, again uh, interesting uh, uh, thing how we can uh, extend this system to cover several stronger logics. Either by uh, something like that, like that, that, that there is a clause with some display formula and we are rejecting it. Or there are uh, with two parameters, for in fact, uh, soon we will see what's going on. With some parameters, either some kind of expansion rule, 
we just change phi for psi, or we have just moved process phi minus psi, we get something like a revolution step and obtain the, the, the concatenation of this. Or it can be that we need three parametric formulas. So again, it may be an extension like that, or an, uh, something which is a mix of resolution step and extension. These two elements are cut out and deleted. This one is added. Or just a resolution of all three formulas. Oh, okay, it can be generalized also for some other things, but what's going on? Let's take for such a um, uh, uh, small selection of the possible conditions. Uh, for instance, if we deal with, uh, uh, with T, reflexivity, yes, it is only one parameter, so this is the first group of rules, or irreflexivity, for instance. Uh, for instance, for symmetry, asymmetry, uh, dichotomy, we have two parametric groups, yes? So, uh, the second class of groups, either in extension, or extension form or resolution form, applies. Several rules like transitivity, Euclideanus, um, uh, trichotomy, for instance, yes, they, they, they are applied, there are three parametric formulas, so we can use uh, the, what, what, what is more uh, flexible for us? Are the extension rules of this mix of extension and, and cancellation of the full resolution step? And uh, oh, here is some example. Of course, it is not uh, there are some trouble, some conditions that are reserved, for instance, which need introduction of some new, uh, of some new. Uh, And uh, for them, the rules must be a bit different. Okay. And with this example, I think I can I can finish. I hope that I uh, I'm not all the time. Okay. Thank you for. Thank you. 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 Um, okay, here we have n two players, opponent, opponent, the 
proponent also showed that the formula is valid, so true in all models. Um, and the proponent also showed that this is not, not the case. And again, we want to show uh, something like the adequacy theorem, so P has a little strategy in the game, if and only if the formula is um, decided. Now, um, a quick word here about uh, proof systems. Uh, proof systems are, in a way, every proof system gives rise to a provability game. Right? If you have a complete proof system, and you think about the sequent calculus, um, uh, proponent chooses which, uh, which rule instance to apply, and if there's branching, opponent chooses which branch um, to go to. And when the game reaches an initial sequence, the proponent wins, and the proponent loses, and the um, formula, formula is valid. Um, now, this is a, a bit of a cheating, right? Because um, um, Dialogate and, uh, for example, Robinson, um, who was um, uh, the first to do um, uh, such a game, um, we call it the Dialogue game, uh, would say that it's uh, the, the dialogue or the game that gives meaning to logic, uh, gives meaning to the connectives, and that it shouldn't be the other way around. So, we should design our, our, our game. And one way of having such meaningful uh, probability games is by, uh, by means of lifting. So we start with a semantic name, and we add um, very natural features to it until we um, arrive at the uh, probability game. Uh, so this idea goes back to this um, Samura. Um, also, if you, if you like the idea, Alexander Pavlova is giving the first talk tomorrow on the logic price, uh, where she gives a uh, um, a lifting of a, uh, of a semantic game for a Okay, uh, quick intuitive idea of how the system would work. Um, you fix a formula and play over all models simultaneously. And we'll see how, uh, how that works. Alright, um, quick outline of the idea of splitting what we discussed. And we will first look at a semantic game for ordinary model logics. Um, see how that doesn't work and how we really need to uh, extend this to, um, uh, to the hybrid, uh, hybrid logic and then our, our lifting um, Alright, um, so this is just a quick slide to um, remember syntax and semantics. The only thing I want to uh, say to you here is that we will, today we'll be working uh, uh, in a fragment of, of, of modal logic or replication only from the proposition of vector variables. That's just to keep the, uh, the presentation um, compact. And in the end, I will explain to you how to extend this game to the language. Alright, um, how does the game look like? Uh, these are the, the rules of the game. Um, so we have a we play over a fixed uh, model. Uh, we have a uh, an active world and an active formula. Depending on the shape of the formula, the main connective um, will tell us who of the two players uh, is to move. So, for example, if we're at a disjunction at the world W, phi, or psi, then the opponent chooses to go to phi the same world or to psi the same world. If we are at a, uh, at a conjunction, then the uh, proponent chooses phi or psi. Um, Dynamic operator, if we have time phi at the world W, uh, proponent chooses a successor of that world, uh, and the game of uh, the successor of B, um, then the game continues with phi at the successor. Um, important uh, side remark, if there is no successor, O immediately wins the game. Another quick note, uh, throughout the talk, uh, P will always be turquoise and uh, opponent will be, will be orange. So. Okay, one thing remains, we have to lay uh, down our win, win condition, who wins at atomic formulas and negations, and here we just um, refer to the truth um, in that model. So, so for example, P, uh, the opponent wins at, at, at P in the world value if P is true in the world value. Here's a simple example. Um, it's a very, very simple model. Um, for example, here we start with a box here, so the opponent. Um, chooses a successor, that is either U or V, and then the game continues with the unbox um, for the um, Alright, um, uh, another remark here, we have a box formula, the game ends here because U has no successor. 
And it's very easy to show, uh, oh yeah, another thing, here's a, um, um, uh, a, a, a winning strategy, uh, so with the third best stages. Um, so no matter how old, what old does the first, first move, if, if P moves according to, uh, to his plan, then she will always end up in the, in the state where, where she moves. Okay? And now it's very easy to show the following theorem. Um, winning strategies for proponent and truth in the model um, coincide. Okay, so P is a winning strategy if and only if, um, um, if the formula is true in the model plan. Alright, um, what is the problem with, um, uh, with, this, uh, with this game? Why can't we limit it to a probability game? And remember, our alternative idea is we want to play uh, simultaneously all games for fixed form uh, overall modes of loss. And the problem that it doesn't work is, um, which you can see in this example, uh, if you just compare uh, the tree rooted in this node and in this node, they involve the same formula, but the trees are different. Okay? Um, so if you think about uh, play, simultaneously playing all games over, over our nodes, what you'll have to do is include some meta theoretic uh, information to your game saying, okay, if the game ends here, then maybe I win. If, if not, then I do this in, uh, these moves. And the way out is to include um, um, hybrid, hybrid language to, to overcome this. Alright, so lifting three steps. First step is we extend the game to hybrid logic. Um, this is our, um, our fragment of the language that we will be dealing with. Again, negation only in front of atomic um, uh, formulas, and this is a bit untypical here. Usually, the real, uh, so these relational um, um, uh, formulas are, are expressed using the diamond operators, but we want our game to end at these, um, um, uh, at these um, formulas expressing the relation, so uh, that way we, uh, that's why we include them as. Alright, uh, rules of the game are very similar to the, to the one we had before. Only difference is basically we don't refer to worlds here anymore, but we uh, just refer to, uh, to nominals. And um, intuitively, again, um, you can interpret this as um, um, uh, uh, saying that, that uh, this the formula is true and the world denoted by nominal. Right, uh, the other thing that changes is, of course, here. Uh, so, uh, remember we had uh, in, in the rules for the, uh, for the original semantic game, um, uh, at the, the diamond operator, the proponent had to choose a successor. Now, what the proponent does is uh, chooses a nominal and defends both phi and the claim that, that J is actually a successor, successor of phi. And um, so this immediately, immediately solves the problem uh, that, um, uh, that game trees, trees are not uniform. Uh, but it comes with further because that we are now infinitely branching in, in very simple, simple games. All right. Um, uh, the the um, atomic, uh, so the winning conditions, uh, we also need this rule to include nesting of, of what we have already basically. And here are the, the um, atomic formulas we again just refer to the truth uh, All right. Um, here's an example of a, of a semantic game. It's just a, a box formula. Um, and I did this to make, uh, to make a point. So technically we would have here the imperial branch because we have the, we have the box rule. Uh, but basically in this, in this, um, um, in this Case, there's basically three types of, of, of nominals, one that denotes the same word as I, one that denotes the same word as K, one that denotes the same word as, as J. Um, and the point I want to make, um, make here is that the, the extension to the hybrid languages is in a way very, very conservative. Right? Because um, uh, the, the bank is, is now on, on the nominals, yes, it's true. But, um, o would never choose to go to a nominal that denotes a world which is not accessible from R. Because if, for example, um, um, P, uh, O chooses to go to, um, to I here, I is not accessible from I, P just chooses 
the negation of this relational uh, claim, and we needed to we needed to move once again. So um, O would never do that. And similarly, if 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 O chooses a um, a world that denotes a successor, um, then uh, he would never uh, would never go to um, uh, the negation of this relational claim because you immediately lose the game there. So what I'm saying is. Um, Yes, we have a legacy theorem here. So um, P is going to extract if and only if uh, the formula is true. But even more is true of uh, the winning strategy in the original game um, very, yeah, corresponds very nicely to winning strategies in the, in the new game, and, and, and vice versa if, if we don't include uh, nominees. All right, uh, so that was the, the, the first step for lifting. The second one is the disjunctive game. Uh, and if we get into the destructive game, what we do is uh, we give uh, P the option to uh, yeah, uh, have kind of insurance against mistakes that you will make. Uh, so uh, what you can do now is create backup copies of the game. Right? Okay, so, so for example, if we're at the formula phi or psi, then these are the old options. So go to phi or go to psi. And additionally, uh, she can duplicate uh, this game state. Right, and play one option here and the other option, uh, the other option here. As a consequence, our game states are not just uh, um, these labeled formulas anymore, but actually uh, this kind of container of, of, um, of backup copies. Uh, the, uh, the winning conditions are uh, very simple. P is succeeds if she wins the, the game in at least one of these um, these backups. Okay. And technically, there's another uh, problem. Rounds of the game can be infinite now, so P can just go on and on and uh, duplicate um, states, and we, we don't want that. So we say that infinite rounds are always winning for all. So P has to win the game in the final round. All right, and uh, uh, interestingly, this doesn't change anything. So, uh, um, the winning strategy, so this um, yeah, duplication of states or creating backup copies doesn't give anything to Pete. Right? And again, we have a, a conservative extension in a way that um, we can kind of extract win ordinary winning strategies uh, from, from this, um, for Pete in this in the, uh, disjunctive game and uh, the other way for this. Is, is so, why did I do that? I did this to so that the last step is very easy. Uh, in the last step, all that we do is we forget the model. Okay? So previously we were playing with the jump game over a model, now we forget it. The only thing, all rules uh, remain the same except for uh, the way it is. Okay? Uh, P wins the game at this state if she wins the game for this in every model. And, that's it. and the game is added. So it added the model's uh, probability. So um, P is a winning strategy in this game, if and only if um, um, uh, phi is a phi is a value. Even more is true uh, from the winning strategy uh, in the probability game, we can extract winning strategies for all the for all the semantic games for, for every single um, model over that formula. Um, and from a winning strategy of, um, of O in the probability game, we can extract both a counter model and a uh, winning strategy for, um, for O in the, the semantic game. All right. Um, here's an example of a Winning strategy for uh, for a probability game. Um, here is a kind of small trick where P does three things at once: uh, duplicate. Uh, so the main thing to make is a junction here. So um, P has to decide either to go to the left or go to the right. But what P does here is first make a backup copy of that state, go to the left in the one copy, go to the right um, in the other copy. And here, um, uh, that's the actual. Game state, we have a box here, but uh, only if it, so technically we have infinite branching, but we can show that it's it's actually optimal for for people to choose an item variable. Right? 
process of allowing more of them. Okay, um, winning strategies can now, as I, as I told you, uh, the proof building game can be seen as a, as, a, as a kind of proof system. All we have to do is take the rules of the disjunctive game and um, basically write them, write them all out. So we have the patterns here. Um, the duplication rule, so the possibility for a P to create a backup copy, plays the form of the, the contractual rule here. And we have these um, um, complex, um, complex axioms, um, if you want. And um, yeah, this is um, a very special um, proof system. In fact, it's a one-sided version of, of uh, many, uh, many sequence systems that are present in the literature. Alright, um, yeah, here's an example. On the left is the strategy for the component, and then what you do is write a bottom up, and that's it. Then that's a proof in the, in the process. Alright, um, let's wrap it up. So we had a, um, we started with a semantic game. What we did is, in three steps, lifted to really do what we did. The first step, uh, step hybrid logic, uh, to, to uh, bring in the, the mental level. Uh, Object level, then uh, going disjunctive, allow people to uh, create the of copies, and the third one was basically just to look for it. And we uh, ended up with a with a um, editing Okay, uh, a few extensions of the game as, a, as promised. Negation, uh, negation already hinted at this is interpreted as a role switch. Uh, so the players are not P and O anymore, but the players are highlighted. Me and you, and in the beginning I act as the proponent, so the proponent of the roles now. I start as the, as the proponent every time, and you as the proponent every time we, um, we um, encounter a, a negation, we switch roles. Okay? Um, okay, we just uh, games, uh, games for enablement can be modeled by giving P uh, a set of, of backup states that she can use at, at any time. And um, for for frame property, of course, we use uh, um, um, we use uh, the hybrid machinery. So genetic theory can be and um, um, of frames can be basically reduced to the um, theories. In the long term, uh, I, I want to be used to use the bias for other logics, and maybe even um, um, yeah uh, find out which uh, which criteria actually allow for. Um, of what is allowed for such lifting and semantic capability. Um, this is a, a, a bit more vague, these two points here. Maybe go the other way around, extract semantic games from probability games, and add imperfect information. This is something that is very usual in, in, in game theory, so that one of the players doesn't have complete information of what node he or she is in at the moment. Um, and this would be interesting uh, to, to see. All right. Uh. All right. Okay. That's my my last slide. Here's some nice uh, references. Um, thank you.
in, in our group and it feels like versions of it um, are, are promising, right, to go the other way around to, to start this probability game and um, directly from the extended, extended sort of semantic game to build the bridge the, uh, the, the other way around. Thanks. Okay. No further questions. I have a question because I think I have a strong example. So, so uh, I think we should uh, thank you. So we continue with half past four as you can. into uh, type theory. I mean, uh, really, my church, uh, of type. And, uh, I call it TY to revisit it because um, such a translation that, um, into um, high order logic uh, was proposed quite a time ago by Galin for uh, Monday Intentional Logic. And I would like to start with that. So, here is a sort of uh, flavor, say, of uh, Montague, uh, Montague in that intentional logic. Okay? Um, if you do not understand all the notations, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not really a problem. Um, what uh, I want to illustrate here, and uh, I'm going to be back to that sort of definition, but what, what I want to illustrate here uh, is that uh, it's really like a build uh, upon the, the simplified lambda columns and high ontology. And of course you could ask, uh, but where is logic? In fact, logic is somehow hidden in this. Uh, in, in the fact that you have a lot of constants, and among those constants you have the, the logical constants, we have the, the usual uh, interpretation, but I will be back on that. But what you have are actually two things that are like not standard in a higher order logic or in the simple theory of type. Um, the first one is this one the, the fact that uh, the interpretation of a constant actually. Uh, it's not like uh, an individual or a relation or whatever. It does not correspond to the interpretation of its type, but it depends upon some index, so uh, uh, upon some uh, possible word. So this is why here we have those i. Uh, those i's are like index, you may think of uh, possible words, and, and so the interpretation is given at some. Uh, at some uh, uh, possible word i. And in the case of the constant, you see that the, the interpretation function v uh, gives, in fact, um, not the, the, the very interpretation of the constant, but the intention, in the sense that uh, it's a function from a set of possible words to uh, the interpretations. So this is i. So that's the first thing. The two of the things are uh, those operators that are not um, that are not present in, in the simple theory of time. And the 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 hat operator, in fact, um, the hat operator uh, takes um, an object say, and um, and gives its intention. So it takes an extensional object and gives its intention. And in fact, it just corresponds to the function that uh, at each possible word i will assign an interpretation of the term at i. Okay. And, and then the, the, the check, the check uh, operator, um, the don't want operator, um, given an intention, give the extension at uh, the given uh, the given. Okay. Um, This was uh, quite uh, historically. This was, this was quite uh, important, uh, but uh, from a syntactic point of view, there, there was a, 
a few problems. Among others, there, there were uh, there were reduction rules. Uh, for instance, you have that uh, check of paths of t is t. Uh, but there were other reduction rules that made uh, the system uh, non trivial okay. And so what Galin did uh, was to simply provide uh, an interpretation of, of it um, into uh, the usual uh, into the, the usual of the simple theory of time. And uh, it's called TY2 because it's a uh, type theory with two uh, atomic uh, with two atomic uh, types. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit ironic here because I'm only using one such type because I'm not speaking about uh, quantification and uh, first of the stuff. But the, the, the two types are the, the type E and T of one day. Oh, sorry, uh, the type uh, S and T of one day. S and E of one day. T is always given. And, uh, and so, um, well, uh, what uh, the translation of Galen does well, is to take a free variable that S is, and that free variable which is of type S, so the type of the, of, of, of the world, uh, stands for the, the current the current uh, the current world. And, and then you see that uh, to take the intention is just to abstract on that variable. And to take the extension is just to instantiate and to apply the value. Okay. And then A is for the constant, because the, the third thing, which was not completely standard, well, each constant of uh, type of is replaced by a constant of type S arrow alpha. So a constant depending uh, upon the, the physical words, and uh, is applied to, to that X. Then uh, there's a byproduct uh, in a paper. Uh, Michael Kanazawa and I uh, proposed uh, a variation of this translation. Okay, the possible the possible defect is that uh, a closed term is not is not uh, translated by a closed term because of that x that may be uh, that may be free. And so the oh yes of course the, the, the translation is correct <laughs> uh, and, and this, then uh, all translation uh, is just like that the, 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 it's basically it's the same translation the only thing uh, is that um, you see we, we abstract everywhere on a variable of type s so lambda i s and uh, that bond variable i corresponds, so to speak, to the current world. Okay. So, in fact, what we do, what we do um, is simply uh, to translate the intention, the intention of the terms, and not the extension. And, and in fact, uh, this translation. Uh, it's rather natural and correspond to well-known uh, operation, and you can uh, give it uh, a version of it using uh, curry combinators, and, and then you recognize very standard combinators, okay? Like like W, for instance, for the for taking the extension, which is uh, the duplicator, uh, as you see the, the last time. And well. Really, this is just a, a, a sort of variation of uh, Gantt's translation. It's the same, it's the same uh, translation in some sense. And you, we have that uh, if we take our translation and if we apply it to XS, the free variable that would stand for the, for the, the current world, then uh, we obtain, uh, obtain Gantt's translation. So that's a, an easy proof by induction. Okay, and then. Um, some time ago, actually, uh, I did uh, use that same kind of translation uh, just to have an embedding of 
hybrid logic. Okay. And so um, here um, we have on the one hand the simply type lambda calculus with uh, usual proposition of logic, positive first of the logic that I'm not speaking about quantifiers here. And, uh, and then on the other hand we have uh, hybrid logic or a fragment of it. And then <coughs> Well, it's really the same idea. Each uh, propositional symbol or each atomic formula uh, will be translated into a symbol depending on the, the possible world. Then the, the connectives are simply lifted. Okay, so um, if you want to take a junction phi and psi, uh, well, you take the conjunction of psi at the current world with phi at the current world. And then for, um, for the three uh, constants that are, uh, that, are, uh, that, that are proper to, to hybrid logic, okay, for nominals, well, this is just a test, an equality test, whether uh, that nominal corresponds to the current world. For um, the at operator, okay, it just consists of intensiating the formula at the, at the, the variable corresponding to the nominal. Okay. And for the number operator, which is like a binding operator, okay, well, you just take J to be the current world, so you bind J, okay, and you apply the interpretation of phi to J, okay, and uh, this may look like uh, a simple e-text tension, but it's not the case because, of course, there might be uh, free occurrences of J in the in the formula phi. In phi. Now, if you, if you look at this translation, you're going to see, well, that there is really something missing because uh, hybrid logic is built upon uh, model logic, so we are the model operators, okay? Uh, so, and in fact, um, there are two possibilities for the model operators. I did not uh, put that here because it, it does not really illustrate what I, my, my point, but the two possibilities are Either, like Galen is doing, uh, to say, okay, I have like uh, a simple theory of types with modalities, in which case it's not very interesting. You know, the box can be translated into the box. Okay. Uh, the other possibility, which is the, the one that I've been following and I've been playing with, is just to add to. Uh, the type theory, symbols, a symbol standing for the relation, and, and then quantifiers, and then just give the, give the normal definition, the normal interpretation of the box. Okay. Um, now, um, just to be uh, a little bit precise, okay, so this is. I was expecting that this would be a, like everybody's stuff. But, uh, but you already see, you have already seen that in the previous talk that it was really thin. So this is the interpretation of uh, the operators, uh, the operators uh, of uh, IV logic. And so the nominal J can be uh, true if the world corresponding to the nominal J is the, the current world of interpretation. And for the, the at uh, for, for, for the at operator, um, then this is going to be uh, true if uh, indeed phi is true uh, at the world uh, for which the, the nominal J stands. And for, um, for the, the binding operator, what 
you do is uh, to say, okay, uh, so the, the binding operator, the intuition of the binding operator is like saying, okay, I'm, I, I'm taking the nominal J uh, is the name of the current rule. I'm, I'm binding uh, J to the rule. So that, that, that's, I, I heard that the guy going to call this operator the tick at noon operator. So J is tick at noon. So, what you do is really that. In fact, in, in your uh, interpretation of the nominals, in your evaluation of the nominals, you say that uh, it's the same as J, except that it, it's the same as G, except that no uh, J is interpreted as uh, W. So, that's the interpretation of uh, hybrid logic, so I, I expect that you we are knowing that, and now, uh, what is a model for uh, type theory? Okay. A model for type theory, so a model of T-Y2. Okay, it's made of, uh, of two things that are very usual in models. Uh, a domain of interpretation, and then an interpretation of the constants. Okay, but uh, we have types. So in fact, we have a domain of interpretation for each type. Okay, we start for, for each type. We have uh, such a domain, and we also have, so to speak, evaluation for each type. Uh, because if we have a constant of type say alpha, we want the we want the interpretation of that constant to belong to the domain which interprets uh, the type alpha. Okay, so so that's why we have this a, a way of seeing it is to say we have families of Families of valuation indexed by the types. T is the set of types. And then what we're going to have is uh, that uh, the interpretation of the truth value should be 0, 1. Okay. Then, well, ds somehow is the, the, the set of uh, possible worlds. It's not really important in the defining model. Um, the S is just a set, okay, it's an atomic type. Um, and then you have this condition that the, the, the domain that interprets alpha or beta, the type alpha or beta, that should be a, a set of functions from the domain that interprets alpha to the domain that interprets beta. If instead of the inclusion you, you would have here equality, then you would have what is called a standard model, but uh, you would lose uh, completeness. Okay? And there is something more that uh, I will say. And then, okay, evaluations, that they, they should, if you take a constant of type alpha, it should be interpreted in the domain of They should respect the type. And then the interpretation, okay, given uh, an interpretation of the free variables, that uh, can also uh, respect the types. So normally I should define maybe such a such a valuation as a family of valuation indexed by types or something like that. Uh, well the interpretation of uh, a variable is, is given by the, the valuation. The interpretation of uh, a constant is given by the family uh, of function of the top of the constants. Uh, the interpretation of an application is really functional application. And the interpretation of lambda abstraction, well, that's the function that uh, to some uh, point d in the domain of alpha uh, will assign as a value the interpretation of t, but uh, when the free variable x is interpreted as b. I know that there might be a problem which is, okay, uh, although I know that uh, this function exists and belongs to, to my domain, okay, that's why you have here some conditions, okay, the simple conditions, is, the simple way of saying it, but it's a little bit simpler, is to say, well, you uh, think that here uh, there are enough functions in the interpretation in order to have this making sense. And then, 
with uh, these two with these two uh, okay, with these two uh, <coughs> definition you may easily show that uh, the translation is correct okay what you have to do is to take uh, ds being the u and then uh, to have the interpretation corresponding to the interpretation and then here I have just written a condition saying that negation conjunction of interpreting the usual logic. Okay. Um, now, uh, what can we do with this uh, with this embedding? Well, uh, for instance, uh, if we take some of the axioms uh, of Inclusive maximization of hybrid logic. Okay, um, you're gonna see that uh, those axioms they are just instance of a well-known tautology, alpha and beta. And you you get this uh, just by computation. Okay, so you unfold the definition of the translation. At some point, you make beta reductions and so and, and so you, you just compute and you end up uh, with something we we'll call alpha and beta and and you will have you will have the same thing for, for instance for the, the, the fact that the gamma rule and the path operator are set to you know, is going to be simply an instance of the double negation and <coughs> For uh, also uh, a lot of other uh, axioms, you will have uh, that they're simply amount to really elementary uh, equality of Okay. So for, for instance, label is nothing but reflexivity of uh, Now uh, is uh, in fact replaced. Okay, swap is uh, swap uh, gonna be uh, uh, symmetric. Um, then just uh, to conclude, well this translation actually the, the, it was first uh, designed for a very uh, practical reason. Why uh, Writing uh, so uh, Montegrovian interpretation of fragments of, <coughs> of language, uh, we just find uh, easier to define uh, to define uh, the operators of uh, hybrid logic as macro, uh, and uh, uh, but then uh, as we have seen, it, it turns out that. Uh, some reasons that might be formulas uh, may be used, uh, may be obtained simply by, by using things like beta reductions, things completely automatic. Then, uh, in fact, uh, this embedding actually uh, is solved by the okay? Because I, I'm, I'm embedding, I, I'm embedding uh, and embedding the, the hybrid logic into uh, type theory. But this act, if I, I take the, the hybrid the, the hybrid theory of type uh, that was uh, developed by, by Carlos Patrick and so on was the so on the back. Uh, so if if, uh, if I take the, the, that high order language uh, of the hybrid uh, type theory then the translation still works. I'm just translating a higher order into higher order, but it's exactly the same translation. And so, uh, I'm currently working uh, in order to see what I may obtain from that uh, and whether uh, I may possibly obtain a completeness result uh, easy uh, from the completeness result, uh, from NK completeness result. The difficulty here is that uh, in order to improve completeness, 
you need an axiomatization, and uh, it's not clear uh, uh, what would be a good axiomatization. <coughs> because, I mean, if, if I'm just like replaying uh, that proof, but uh, in another language that, that would not be used, but it's maybe related to the fact that one would like to have maybe a sequence of elements uh, for, for high order. And then another another thing also is that uh, after all it may be mixed uh, with the, the translation we started with from intentional logic into factory and, and maybe uh, <coughs> mix those in order to uh, to have translation and, and we are still being uh, intentional. Uh, a question 
question is that um, you, you said you want to like, prove completeness to this uh, method, for example. So what you mean is, uh, with this embedding, and you know you have like, completeness with respect to um, Hankins matrix uh, for simply type number calculus, and then we want to use this to uh, have completeness for the Hubble project, or what exactly is so that? The, the models we have here are clearly Hankins models. Yeah. Due to the fact that we have this inclusion, not equality. Uh, what, uh, what they use uh, in, in the intention of hybrid logics are also in game models with that uh, inclusion. Otherwise, they, they would not have, uh, they would not have uh, completeness. If you have a standard model, for instance, you may, uh, you may express piano axioms. So to have completeness would contradict the theory. So, Okay, uh, and so what we have here, at least, is uh, is <coughs> some sort of correctness. Okay, so if we take the, the language of, of uh, intentional hybrid logic, okay, we may show, uh, we, but by uh, <coughs> by uh, taking and uh, by taking my, my MD, and then the standard interpretation of uh, sim simple theory of type into LK models, you get exactly the interpretation they have in, in that paper. Okay. And so the question is <coughs> would it be possible to, to find an argument uh, that would uh, give completeness of, of some axiomatic system using the translation? But then you need something like uh, everything which is, uh, which is every, everything which is provable using uh, church simple type theory in the language of hybrid, hybrid logic is also provable. Uh, is also provable. It's exactly provable. With the origin of the system. But you need somehow, you need somehow uh, an axiomatic system or sequence calculus or something. You, you need a notion of, uh, of, uh, of proof for uh, an intentional act of touch. And, and if I take the axiomatization they take in the paper, uh, there is no real gain. At the moment, I do not find really a gain, uh, a gain in uh, replaying. Okay, so I think we have to wind up. Um, ask questions if I'm um, worried about something and, and or you didn't understand something or you acoustically don't understand me because I think the acoustics here are difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I will talk about hybrid team logics and um, well, first of all, model checking games. Here we already had a very nice introduction to model checking games, so thank you for that. Um, but for those who are not here, I will um, recall what model checking games are about. So model checking in general is just if we have any logic and then a formula in this logic and some potential model, however this may look like, and then the question is, it does this potential model satisfy the formula? And one way to approach this question are model checking games, where we have, which are mostly two-player games, which with a falsifier and a verifier, which I call also one and two, um, and the falsifier tries to falsify the statement and the verifier tries to verify the statement. Um, and the goal when designing such games is always to have a winning strategy for the second player, for the verifier, if and only if the formula is satisfied by the structure. So let's look at a model checking game for hybrid logic. Very basic. So let's say we have a point um, of structure, an assignment, and a formula. I um, do not go into detail about the semantics, partly because we already got about them, and partly because they 
uh, made clear by the game anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, but we have this one script, it's such an assignment and formula, and then we have this game um, that is just desi designed to be parallel to the semantics. So we start at this position with the vertex, the assignment and the formula, the, the structure itself is not as important because it never changes. And we end in these types of positions where we are, have literals. And then the, the verifier just wins if the literal is satisfied by the point of group structure with the assignment in this position. And to go from the starting position to the, these end positions, we move along some type of game tree. So for example, if we have a conjunction here, then we basically have the statement Psi 1 and Psi 2 is true. So then of course the, web, uh, the falsifier has to say, well, no, one of these formulae is not true. And so the falsifier chooses where we proceed to play. And similar for the disjunction with the um, verifier, for the dynamic operator, for example, we're looking at all successes of our current vertex. And then the verifier can choose one of them from which we proceed to play. And now introducing some rules for these uh, hybrid logic um, formulae. So if we have this down arrow binder, then we just extend our assignment by the current vertex for this um, state variable. For the existential um, binder, the um, verifier just chooses some vertex, and for the satisfaction for a satisfaction statement, we just proceed to play from the vertex designated uh, that is assigned to the uh, variable A without any choice at all. So we just go there. Yeah, and this way we get a game tree, so with basically the root is the starting position and then we go outwards and all the leaves are the literals. <coughs> and yeah, so recall the idea behind these, these um, strategy games, that these one checking games is that the verifier has a winning strategy. So what does this mean? A winning strategy just means um, the starting position is part of this partial tree, then we have at least one choice for every choice that the verifier makes, and we have all choices that the falsifier can make, so that we know that there is an answer to everything that the falsifier could do. For example, if this is our structure, three nodes with these kind of connections, and we have this type of formula, um, which basically says that our current vertex is not reflexive, but um, has another vertex which it is connected to both ways. So then how would this game play out? We start here, so like I said, there is no choice at all. We just extend our assignment. Then we have a conjunction here, so our um, falsifier can choose, and we have to account for both choices. Then, if you look at here first, we have this um, box operator, so again, we have to account for both choices that could be made. And then we are at literals, and these are satisfied, so it's all is well for the verifier. And down here, the verifier can just make two choices, which he does accordingly, and then again, our literal is satisfied. So this is a strategy tree for this game, for the verifier. So now, if we have these strategy trees, I mean these strategy trees are basically um, certificates that the formula is satisfied in a certain structure, or a certain model. And an idea what one could do now is that we engrave these um, strategy trees in our model, or in general in models, and then use this engraving to define a formula so that this strategy tree is somehow um, 
represented by this formula. And then, of course, this satisfaction statement should also hold this. This would be kind of pointless. Um, for whatever models then are relevant for this type of formula. And this type of engraving would then transfer the satisfaction of this formula to another logic maybe, or to another structure at least. But we will see how, what I mean, mean with that. And this type of engraving is exactly where hyperlogic is relevant, because, I mean, in a sense, this is exactly what hyperlogic does. We take certain elements of the structure which we find interesting and give it proper names, nominals. So this is exactly what we do. We take, for each node in our strategy tree, we take a new nominal, which is then, so the intuition behind it then is that it just signifies the um, vertices we are at in this node. And so and if you have an existential formula, then we take, have to take another nominal to signify this bound variable then. And then we define the behavior of these nominals by a rather large formula. Um, so for example, we say that at the nominal designating a node with a literal, we want to have that this literal is satisfied. Or at a nominal, um, or well, the, the nominal designating the node of a conjunction is supposed to be the same as the nominals designating both conjuncts, because as we saw um, here, for example, the, the vertex doesn't change. Yeah, and I mean, the, the other cases are similar. And then, yeah, like I said, all these other cases are very straightforwardly transform or engraved in this sense. Um, because of the way hybrid logic works, so this is a very natural way to go about this. Um, here we have to be a bit careful with the um, state if we arrive at, if we have a um, state variable as a formula in our node, then it depends a bit on where it comes from. But for example, for the extension claim, we, we have this additional nominal that we introduced exactly for this case, so this is fine as well. And yeah, then the satisfaction statements. Um, there we say nothing about the nominal of the node itself, it just becomes irrelevant. Instead, we just go to the nominal of our um, of our that it corresponds to our upside prime here. So, yeah, so I hope I could make clear in some way to how this engraving works and why it works as well, and why it's connected to hybrid logic. Um, one comment about box and for all and this stuff, because I, if you notice, I mean, I didn't go into detail, but if you notice, I left it out. The problem is, like you already pointed out, there we might have infinite choices. And then, of course, we get problems with, as long as we don't want to move to infinitary logic. And so, for example, we have a box operator. We could, in theory, define something like this. So we could say that every neighbor of our nominal at the moment is one of the nominals designated to all the other choices. And um, the converse as well. Um, but yeah, this might be infinite if we have infinite neighbors of our current vertex. So this is not um, has drawbacks which I don't want to go in right now. Um, yeah, but overall, if we leave that out, we have. If you notice here, the only thing I use on this side is our satisfaction statements and nominals. And um, here I use a lot more of ingredients. So what I do is I transfer the satisfaction of a hyperlogic formula with all these ingredients to the satisfaction of a hyperlogic formula with just nominals and satisfaction statements. Where satisfaction is a bit of a difficult word because I use it with two meanings, but I hope you understood what I meant. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
And like I said, I'm not really too deep into the hyperbolic branch of this whole thing. So my question is, are there other applications for this technique? And there is one very straightforward application, which is team logics. Um, can someone tell me what time it is? Just so I can measure it. Okay. Yeah. So, team logics. Um, I would assume that most of you are not familiar with team logics. Um, so I'll try to explain here what this is about. Um, team logic, the basic of team logic is just first order logic at first. So we have the basic first order syntax. I hope that you're familiar with that. Um, and then we change the semantics. Instead of just single assignments, like in regular first order logic, we have teams of assignments. Um, and you can think of this like databases, for example. So, for example, the list of all people that are registered here um, is such a, maybe such a team, instead of just every single person as a possible assignment. And then we can ask questions about these teams. For example, is um, if you have literals, like relations, um, where we can say, is everyone here Greek, for example? Uh, so this is the intuition about um, these literals because they are all, always supposed to be satisfied if they are satisfied for every entry in the team. And then for the uh, connectives, conjunction just works as always. Um, it's, the team satisfies a conjunct, conjunctive formula that satisfies both conjuncts. Um, this junction works a bit different than one might assume. Um, here we are also going with the intuition that if I say that a, a list is, contains only, for example, red and blue entries, well, red or blue entries, then it might, this makes sense if I can split the list into smaller lists where one list is just blue and one list is just red. And this is exactly what happens. So, this, this junction is satisfied if I can split my team into two smaller teams, they may overlap so that each of the smaller fields of the teams uh, satisfies the corresponding formula. Um, and assign. Ah, ah sorry. Um, the extension quantifier is, works with extensions, so normally with um, regular first order logic. We extend one assignment by one additional variable. Here we allow um, sets, extension by sets. So for every, for example, here we have this universe with these uh, five elements, and then we have a team that consists of two assignments. And then we say this assignment gets extended by these two elements, and this assignment gets, gets extended by these three elements. And the result is this. So A gets extended to AA and AC, and B gets extended to uh, these three assignments. So we, we might uh, enlarge the team. And yeah, then the for all multiplication is also a bit unintuitive, maybe, because there's not, this is not the dual of the extension multiplication in some sense, but we just extend the team by all possible choices. Um, one word about the choice of this junction, or also why we, why we don't have negation step in the normal semantics, except for literals and stuff like that. So we could, of course, um, also define something like a strong junction. Um, this works, and this is sometimes done for various reasons. But one thing that this version of uh, first order team logic has is that it has flatness. And flatness means that a formula is satisfied by a team if and only if it is satisfied by every assignment in the team. And I mean, this is a very natural way to define it, but it's also kind of boring. So um, I will now extend this basic first order logic with the down arrow binder from hybrid logic and 
thereby create my version of Hacking Team Logic. And so this means that um, I bind the current team that I'm, that I'm looking at over specific variables that I may, or over variables that, that I may specify, and then this is just an extension of the old structure. So I just take it as an additional relation. And this is also this is why this works very well because I mean in regular first order logic or team logic we know how to handle relations. So this binder, which this hybrid logic binder in this case with teams just creates additional relations, and this is very has nice um, properties which we will see. So because we can again uh, define monotech models. <laughs> And repeat basically repeat the process that we just did. I mean, now we have both different position, positions. Now we have teams and formulae instead of vertex, vertices, uh, assignments and formulae. But basically, it's basically the same. The first two cases, um, of course, the same. Here we see that the verifier can choose how to split the team, and then the falsifier has to choose. Where, where we will proceed. Yeah, yeah, we'll just go through extensions and then again here with the down arrow binder we don't have a choice at all, we just uh, do as the down arrow binder says and extend our structure by the current team. So this is this was the crash course in team logic. <laughs> Before I proceed, I want to give you the chance to air total confusion. Okay, but if this is not the case, that's great. Um, so, because now we're getting to the meat of it. Um, again, we can, of course, in the, we, we of course, we have this one checking game as, as, again, and now, um, of course, there are strategy trees again. And again, we can try to decode these strategy trees as formulae. And there we again use the same intuition as we used the last time, except now we don't use vertices and decode them as nominals, but now we have teams and decode them as relations, which is again the intuition about this down arrow binder. This is why this works so well. Um, yeah, I, I think you understood how this works, so I won't go into detail here. Um, but this again then translates our hybrid team logic to now regular first order logic. And that's very a very strong result because everything we can say that we want to know about the satisfiability of um, hybrid team logic cannot be reduced to the satisfiability in regular first order logic. So, this is a short recap of what we did right now. We use the functionality of hybrid logic to engrave these strategies in structures and then define the behavior of these engravings with formulae in other logics and thereby we transfer the satisfiability problem from, for example, this logic to this or from like I said, hybrid team logic to first order logic. And, okay, well, um, one thing I did not talk about right now. Do, uh, did you have a question? No, no, I'll ask it when you think. Okay. okay. Um, one thing I left out uh, up to this point is um, is hybrid team logic actually interesting? <laughs> because, I mean, I can just use it and it's fine, but does it really add anything? And the question, at least in my opinion, is that it's absolutely interesting. Um, but to know why, we have to go a bit deeper into team logics and why team logic as a whole are actually interesting. Um, and the reason is that with team logics we can reason, and this is also the reason why they were invented in the first place, and we can reason about things like dependence or independence. Um, so here, for example, or, which is interesting, more interesting for now, we can say a uh, reason about inclusions and exclusions. So um, in this case, for example, a 
T satisfies an exclusion answer if all entries in the X variable, the, the set of all entries over the X variable, is a subset of the set of all entries in the Y variable. And yeah, basically the opposite here is when they are disjunct. And these logics have quite um, interesting properties. For example, I think the most important ones, at least for now, are these two down here. So independent logic is equivalent to existential second order logic. And also inclusion exclusion logic is equivalent to existential second order logic. And exclusion logic is also the same as dependence logic, which is quite interesting. And inclusion logic is the same as positive greatest fixed point logic, which um, yeah, is interesting for mostly for um, in the finite model case where it's the same as just fixed point logic. And why do I um, focus on inclusion and exclusion? Well, inclusion and exclusion can be very easily expressed in hybrid in this hybrid team logic. Because I mean if we think about it, if we say this the team over the variables x is if a subset of the team over the variables y just comes down to I save my team over the variables y and then check if the variables uh, if the evaluation over x is in there. And similar here, just with the negated um, version. And in fact, we can make this very precise and say that first of the inclusion logic is the same as hybrid team logic where the bound team may only appear positively. Um, exclusion logic is the same as hybrid team logic where the bound team may only appear negatively, and then both together are just the same as hybrid team logic. So hybrid team logic is again the same as oh, well, in some sense equivalent to existential second order logic. And well, if I have, if I still have time, which I guess I have, but I, I'll make it short. It's actually short. Yeah, it, it will be short. So just one small rundown of what I'm actually working on. And this is Gala team logic. So Gala logic is just a, um, a generalization of model logic. Some of you may, may be familiar with it. The, the most important difference is that we are not moving along just edges, but we are looking at hypergraphs and can move along hyper edges then. And, uh, but it retains almost all of the nice properties of modern logic. And especially it is decidable. And yeah, <coughs> and for this we can, like we did with regular first order logic, we can transfer now the satisfiability problem of Garland hyper team logic to Garland, to just a regular first Garland fragment of first order logic with single assignments without any teams at all. And for this, like I said, we, we have all these nice properties. So for example, we immediately know that Garland hyper team logic is decided. Yeah, so and this is the hierarchy of the scalar technology because there are lots of open questions. All the red arrows are open questions. Um, so there's lots of work to do. But I hope I can make clear that this is interesting. Um, and I hope yeah, that this was at least somewhat approachable and enlightening to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I want to first ask one question to, to, to see if I understand correctly the big picture of what you've missed. Yeah? Let's leave the team logics aside. So now, so we look at like hybrid logic. Now, you start off with a model checking problem for hybrid logic. Yes. And then, uh, well, then you try to translate it, or you, you reduce it to uh, model checking games and the question who has a then we're encoding the, well, a, a strategy tree into hybrid logic, and then you're model checking this new huge formula that encodes the uh, existence of a strategy tree again in hybrid logic. Is that correct? Yeah. That's... But then the question, I mean, you, you start off with a surely small formula, and then you end up with a huge formula, so what are you gaining there? Well, again, um, the uh, Expressibility in another logic. So I mean, in the, honestly, I'm not. 
super sure if this is really a um, <coughs> if this is really a, a significant advantage in this case. I know that here it is, um, but yeah, like, like I said, here I reduce basically the, this logic, which includes um, diamond and extension and non error binder to just the logic with the satisfaction operator. So this is the game. Um, all right. Well, so you are. By the way, you were talking model checking. Now this is about satisfiability, but I, I can guess that you are also encoding the existence of a model and then the existence of it. Yeah, I mean, if the, the goal is that if the if this encoded formula is satisfiable, or the, the goal is that this encoded formula is satisfiable if and only if the um, original formula is satisfiable, and well, the, the goal to this goes through the model checking. Okay, so I presume we don't have much time, so I just want to just pose the question as yes. an open question to you, but I mean, uh, I don't know whether you have some good complexity estimates of uh, what you are gaining complexity-wise there, but my feeling, or my guess is that you would not be gaining uh, in terms of the complexity of the problem. It would be more complex, even though it is in a simpler logic, because to model check the whole strategy tree, you have to do a lot more work than Yes. Uh, model checking the original formula. So that my guess is that, uh, again, from a practical perspective, yeah. your complex perspective, you probably are not getting. Uh, this, I, this is something I can very much concede. I, I would assume the same. Um, yeah, but this is also not what I was interested in when <laughs> I looked at it. So, yeah. Okay, so I think we have to stop.
Basically, you just have an ontology that you do everything based on it. And math, the role of mathematics to logic and formalism is just to exactify the ontology. So you don't have just, just formalism that you have ontology to do. In this case, the primitive principles of tense logic are derived as theorems from the ontology. Concepts are defined in terms of the assemblies is math. First, the generic fusion, the grip frame as applied in dense logic is found in the ontology of time. And then a more comprehensive fusion, the concept of time and hybrid temporal operators are found in the generic fusion. And finally, interaction axioms that govern the interaction of the past directed, future directed operators are derived as theorems by applying the hybrid operators. So there's a, this is done already published, there's a lot of work to do with this. And the intended result is an understandable totality, where nothing hangs in the air but stands upon the ontology. So not just formalism, but the reasons for the formalism too. And why, why, why this, why not just formalism? So, here in Greece, Aristotle said, people desire to know and understand. So, we must inquire what are the reasons, the causes, the principles behind the mathematics. And modern movement strive for rigor, but do not allow it to curtail and vigor. So, it's like the formalism or logic is not for the sake of itself, from my point of view. Say, for the sake of other things. Okay, it must be understandable for non specialists, as programmers, philosophers, ontologists, uh, knowledge engineers, whoever. For instance, we take uh, any application programmer in any firm, does he understand like the normal logic paper? It's very hard, very hard. So, one of the goals here is to found it on an understandable ontology and maybe the programmers could understand it too. So, the ontology. And please tell me when I have five minutes left. So, first linear version. This is the present, present state. Here are the past state, the asterisks and the dashes. They are the future states. Very simple. It's like a up to the past infinity and future infinity. So that's a linear causal practice. And the passage of time, so the present is here. These do not exist, and these do not exist. The next step, the T3 stops to exist, ceases to exist, and T4 becomes into existence. Next step, T5 becomes into existence, and T4 ceases to exist. So the process is potentially infinite. That means that new state becomes into existence all the time. It never stops. And then the branching version. So it's otherwise the same as the linear version, except there are lots of future possibilities. And these are branches that are detached or disconnected from the present. They're there, the future possibilities Past, but no longer. So what I think is the commonsensical view of time, but many people disagree. Okay, then axioms that yield causal presence. Quite simple axioms. So presentism, an absolute simultaneity, but there's only one thing that exists as a presence that all its parts exist at the same time. So this is not a relativistic ontology. Then positive duration it makes the system discrete, a lot easier than a continuous system. And causality, there's a deterministic and indeterministic version. More of that soon. And then irreflexibility of causal success. It also only means that uh, uh, one state can be its own success, so it excludes cycles. So, the causality axiom is important for the defining 
logic. In both cases, the present, beyond by P, is getting an effect of exactly one state. T is for the totality of the state. The direct causal predecessor, predecessor of P. And in deterministic or linear version, P causes the possibility of coming into existence of exactly one causal successor. And in the branching system, it causes several, the possibility of several successors. And now, the Kripke frame. When I apply the test logic, U is a set of positive worlds that are interpreted as instance of time. And the small band symbol is an accessibility relation that is interpreted as a temporal succession relation. So it's a matter of uh, building up on this direct causal successor relation. So I skip to the PDF temporarily. Here is otherwise the same, the past, present, and 
past, they are one uncorrelated. These are, at this point, ignored, they don't have to be taken into account. But then the future is defined as match by using superimposition. So it only means that uh, this part is superimposed by one, two, three different worlds, possible world states. So that's about defining time. Then T is the same time as T that you can use that symbol now. It is true when T and T mark you know the same state or the same states. It's a future now. Then T is earlier than T mark. It's true when each state denoted by T is a causal successor of some state denoted by T, and vice versa. Each state denoted by T is a causal predecessor of some state denoted by T mark. This. Then we move on to point accessibility. So we have to start with the schema. This is just a short for a set of all states that are from the aspect of time t accessible at the target t mark. So there's an aspect time, point accessibility relation to the target time. So the layer is left page for if somebody wants to check it. For instance, from the present, <coughs> accessible one day at the future are all these days. This is one day in the future. I use this symbol because uh, the page for was the founding, founding the PowerPoint. So P forward is just forward from the present where the target time is greater than the present. So when we go here to the future it's a deterministic system, then the accessibility schema is just a set of exactly one causal successor of P, which is realizable at the target time. And in the branching system is a set of several states that are realizable. P blackbird in both cases where the uh, target is in the past and the aspect is P is just a single causal predecessor of P that was realized. And synchronic that means that the target and the aspect are the same. For instance, P is accessible from its own aspect. So this is just a now we move on to the operators that apply the schema. So we have a length one operator, operator schema that applies length one chain. And we can have operators with any length that apply this length two schema applies to length two accessibility. And length three operator applies length three chain, as is the chain. <clears throat> so this is just read as it is, was, or will be modality from the aspect of T that a property type is, was, or will be realized at T mark. So M is the modality, T is the aspect time, T mark is the target time. By its property or disjunction of properties. So then PA1 operator, so it's length one point accessibility operator, that's just an instance of the scheme where the modality is assigned. So we have the basic model is possibility, contingency, necessity, impossibility. And neutrality is added in order to handle future contingents systematic. We will see what this means. And then PA1 proposition is an instance of an operator where all the variables are variables are assigned. And in linear system propositions are true for 
false and they come in there enough times. But in the gravity system, it's like a true or false, indeterminate, the thing combination where the time, tar aspect time is P or earlier. It can be, the aspect can be in the future because it is unclear which time it would be, or which state it would be. And now it becomes clear why we apply this scheme. Because the PA1 proposition basically states that a specific number of elements of the set conform to the property. That is, the modalities are quantifiers over the accessibility of the scheme. So, the possibility statement is true if at least one element of the schema conforms to the property. Necessity is true if every element conforms to it. Impossibility is true if no element conforms to it. And contingency is true if at least one but not every element conforms to it. Of course, we can define some of these by the terms of others, but we can also do it by quantification. And I'll deal with neutrality a little bit later. Where we talk about forward direct propositions where the aspect is later than the target. And let's take a concrete example. The property is the duration of Helsinki, and the aspect time is the present. Okay. It's possible from the aspect of the present of the lifestyle. It's possible from the aspect of the present that it will rain at T mark in Helsinki. So it's true if it rains in Helsinki in at least one element of the axis of the scheme. Otherwise false. And necessity, true if it rains all elements of the scheme. And impossibility, true if it rains in no element of the scheme. And contingency, again, true if it rains at least one but not in every element. Then neutrality. Okay, neutrality is just like it is neutral from the aspect of the present that it will rain in Helsinki at T mark, or just that it will rain in Helsinki. The typical example, the classical example, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. So that's why I just call it neutrality. So it is true if the necessity statement is true, it's quite natural. If you state at the present that it will rain tomorrow and it rains in all the branches, all the future branches tomorrow, it's natural to consider it true. Then again, if it rains in no branches tomorrow, it's natural to consider that the neutral statement is false. Then again, it rains in some branches but doesn't rain in others. So it is contingent that it rains. That is, I think, natural, natural to consider it indeterminate. So, this way, indeterminacy and future contingence, they are parts of a unified system, no more special case. Quite natural, I think. And backward directed and synchronic propositions, they are even simpler. There's Jörg Henrik von Richt, who has published an article about these kinds of propositions or modalities. He has commented this. It's indeed true because possibility, necessity, and neutrality are equivalent. Because if it's possible that it rains, rain yesterday, it's also necessary. Because there, there's only one state, one state only. Impossibility, there's only one state, two. So if it doesn't rain there, then it's true. And you can you can just keep the modalities and just say, well, it did not rain yesterday. Similarly, you can just keep the modalities in the, with this possibility of positive statements said it rained. So you don't need modalities. Contingency statements are always false because there's only one element. So the definition of contingency 
never comes out full field. So basically you need with the black work diary, you, you don't need more than it is, you only need this positive and negative statements. And in fact, you don't need these kinds of modalities in the in the linear system at all. As you only need these kinds of modalities in talking about forward directed or diachronic propositions in the branching system. And here is the quantified propositions, so let's just take one. So it is possible from the aspect of T that there exists a T mark greater than T where property of phi is realized. So you can formulate whatever kinds of uh, quantifications with this semantics. Okay. When we compare this to standard temporal operators created by Prager, you can see there's Operate is separate from linear and branching system plus the standard operators for branching systems lack expressive power because they cannot target a single one specific time. Versus field operators that are valid for both linear and branching system and provide more expressive power. So many people we don't know that the prior operators have roots with the ancient antique statistical operators. They are positively, positively true, it's just true sometimes. Necessary true. Necessarily true is always true, and possibility is always false. Because we take prior operators, you can see that he just added the point of evaluation. So future possibility. Will sometimes be true after point of evaluation. Five minutes, okay. And necessity will always be true after the point of evaluation. Past possibility was true sometime before the point of evaluation. It was always true. So we can see that we can define this antique modalities in terms of priors and modalities. And what I'm doing, I'll show that I can define priors modalities in terms of this P of operators. So in a linear case it's quite simple. But anyway, you can see that that's a good possibility. Phi will sometimes be true, that is defined. It is possible that phi will hold that response after it. So there it is. The branching systems, that's a branching over Earth, that's a real, real deal. Yeah. What, I, from what I've studied or so I've shown, let me see that uh, this study focuses on Paris person and Paris operators. And they quantify our linear substance of view, they're quite heavy. So, Person numbers quantify over histories that pass through a point of evaluation such as the present one. So they quantify over all branches come from here, go here, 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 all histories that pass through a point of evaluation. <coughs> so for instance, that a realization of property in futures has to be determined is defined as in all histories that pass through that pass through. They have it has a successor that the instant is already file. So we can just drop the past and talk about maximal subsets of the future. That's pretty much similar. And as we see, we have already some people have already already done this. So it's not my invention. This is still the second order as they point out or you find a subset. But these can be all defined in terms of PA operators. And not all these have to be defined. I'll skip.
steep level because the time runs up. Okay. But we can also come up with strictly first order system by taking only a partial stretch, partial stretch of the future and quantify over it. So we know that some, some properties like this it's absolutely determined. It's, it's not in, infinity in the future. It's somewhere in the future, like in a hundred years. So we only quantify over that part. And then we'll just define uh, the operators by quantifying over over uh, finite stretches of the future. And finally, we derive interaction theorems as interaction axioms and theorems, but there's no time for this now, I believe. Just check them. So I won't show you now, but it's very, very simple proofs. And uh, to conclude, hybrid tense logic was founded on a symbol of ontology of time. The Kripke frame was derived, the interaction axioms were derived. We can see it. And prior operators were defined in terms of PA operators. So, this was a very quickly, very quick run through. It could have lasted an hour easily. But thank you for listening. and starting to exist if um, it is uh, um, if, if so <coughs> you said that discreteness is a kind of criterion uh, which means that you rule up rule out uh, graduality or situations in which something uh, uh, both um, exists and does not exist for assuming that there is a point between ceasing to exist and starting to exist, oh, yes. uh, where where some an item yeah, well, is and is not. You no, know, of course we do not know if the world is actually discrete or continuous or what you miss. So uh, so I just selected the discrete system because it's much simpler to work with. So this is just an example. But if we if we assume the discrete system, so it follows that you just have to take something exists for a positive period of time in this case, and then just snap, it ceases to exist. So there's no middle, middle. So that's it. Thank you. I wonder if you have a notion of complexity or inside of this logic that you. Well, uh, I it's think it's, uh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I assume, of course, that it's absolutely decidable. Of course, you can make a second order. You can make second order operators, but the basic system is at least uh, it's decidable because everything is built from this one, starting from one atom, then taking the accessibility, direct accessibility, and then building on it step by step. So that's at least decidable. Okay, so thank you for starting on. So that was enough for, for, for today. So thank you for coming and thank you for the uh, great talk that we are heard today to, from the speakers. So I think now we are safe to